All right. Hey, um, I'm I'm Josh. Uh, Josh Allen B online on Twitter. Josh Allen Bradbury in other places. You can call me Josh. Um, <clears throat> I'm nervous. I have a bad throat. Forgive me if I don't make sense at all times. And uh, yeah, this is my talk. It's called Make It Jiggle, and it's pretty scattered. And from my own personal experience, so um, yeah, let's make it jiggle together. <laughs> well, thank you so much. By the end of this talk, <laughs> I want to give you insight into how I personally think about animation and movement in games and interactive experiences. Is my is my little buddy talking? Uh, it's not amazing. Ah, uh, hello. <laughs> hey. All right. Um, let me just. I'm just going to quickly change something here. I'll just give him a bit more of a. Uh, All right, all right, all right, all right. Hi. Is that better? <laughs> all right. Also, he'll pick up what you're, what you're saying, so, yeah, you know. Um, OK. <laughs> all right. <laughs> OK, uh, so I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Hopefully, you might be able to learn something to apply to your own work through what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's generally my hope after this talk, when presented with any new visual or design element, I want you to be first thinking, how can I make anything on my screen move? And then, why does it move? All right. Uh, cool. <laughs> so, I uh, don't know if you noticed, but I created an um, audio reactive puppet um, <laughs> to help me, help me do this presentation. I haven't named him yet, but I think I'll go with Josh. Um, so, Josh's arms move up and down and left and right based on the volume and note in the room. So, let's try it out. If we just all just make a random note, you'll see the arms go all over the place. So. <laughs> And then go lower. Oh. Oh, okay, lower and louder. Oh. So it moves that way, right? <laughs> louder and higher. Oh. Okay, cool. Um, so let's let's start this talk together. <laughs> See if you can get there. Come on, come on. Steady note. Oh, almost. Almost. Oh my god. Is it even working? Try again. <laughs> Try again. Go, 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 go. All right. I'll go with you. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so as a kid, analyzing how things moved has always been my deal. Almost every day, I would constantly be jumping on the trampoline, making up ninja flips and kicks. Uh, to be honest, I'm pretty sure that's where I began designing games, albeit ac accidentally. I got into so many trampoline adventures that often I'd be jumping on the tram trampoline until after sundown. Um, in these jumping games I would make up, I'd create events and tasks to complete. For example, if I imagined a, a, a rolling log coming at me, I had to execute a front flip but within two bounces or else it would kill me. If a group of baddies approached, I had to do at least a 360 degree spin with one leg out. Dispersed among these actions in my head were various cringeworthy poses, phrases and actions I had learned from Power Rangers. Um, I freaking loved my trampoline. It was great. <laughs> As I went through my education and uh, general growing up, I was enamored by expressing myself artistically in some way or another. Sculpting, dressing up and acting were things that stuck for me. But I was constantly distracted by Pokemon, cartoons and any computer screen in the vicinity. Uh, by the time I reached year 11, I decided to teach myself how to use 3D Studio Max and made a terrible go at it. Um, but it came back to me again as I was finishing high school. I decided that the only obvious choice for me uh, was to combine all the things uh, by the end of high school, that was. Um, <laughs> I decided that the only obvious choice for me was to combine all the things I loved together, acting, sculpting, and Pokemon. What came out? 3D animation. Yeah, why not? Um, so straight after that decision, um, is he working? Oh, come on. 
hey. <laughs> I packed up my whole life in my car and moved from Tasmania to Melbourne for study. A great idea at the time, but I had a really tough uh, time uh, and discovered that study and uni really wasn't my calling. The technical skills I was able to develop for 3D and the problem solving uh, skills that I learned, however, turned out to be invaluable. The seeds of how uh, to think about motion were sown during uni as well. I also had terrible taste. I hate everything that's on the screen right now. Um, all right. Until, I had terrible taste until <laughs> I discovered, uh, oh, hold up, I'm, out, I'm in the way, just a second. All right, better. <laughs> Um, until I discovered the flourishing online independent animation scene um, that, the, at the time, I think that was around 2013, um, 2012, uh, particularly uh, Late Night Work Club and David O'Reilly. Uh, it was fresh and punk and colourful. I, I was awakened. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait a moment for you to take pictures or video of each of these great films. Please check them out or just search for Late Night Work Club on, um, online. Give it a go. Um, uh, wait, where are my arms going up? There we are. <laughs> it's a bit, it's a bit delayed. Ah, oh, it's a, hello. Hello. Oh, whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, between searching for work as a freelance after, after uni and, um, and searching for direction for my art, I explored combining my love of music with uh, my skills in animation. The two art forms, uh, like music and animation, are quite similar in many ways. Uh, like rhythm and flow are so important to each of them. So I was really trying to do that uh, with these. These are these are two just random things I attempted to do, but it's really laggy. Yeah, cool. There you go. <laughs> um, looking at my animation heroes, I realized that uh, literal character animation was only the beginning. Shape, silhouettes, negative space, text, colour, transitions, effects, cameras were all just impo as important. It was all just pixels moving on the screen. So uh, my perspective on animation and visual communication uh, was forever changed and, and continued to develop. All right. Um, so I, uh, then I discovered the uh, independent game scene in Melbourne through um, IGDA uh, meetups and things like that, um, I, and began attempting to transfer what I had learned about animation and filmmaking to games. A few game jams, trailers, a lot of hard, high work, and hi, I'm talking to you, hi. <laughs> uh, most of our, uh, my experience is in small teams. Um, so uh, Unearth is a... Um, failed procedural infinite world action adventure that was also online, hence the failed. Um, <laughs> Go Long is one of my uh, favorite ga jam games uh, that I worked with An An Andrew Brophy on, um, where you try and hype up a child athlete before the big hurdles race and try and make sure that your father's proud of you. Um, <laughs> And uh, Framed 1 and 2 were my first larger games I got to work on as an animator. And Love Shack here in Melbourne, the studio, was so great to work with. And make sure you check out their games on iOS. Um, as I began to create these animations for games and learning as I went, I was creating trailers and, and, and other um, marketing content as well. I, I began um, I, and realized how integral movement can be to creating a, a cohesive experience and was surprised that many small studios didn't even think twice about animation or the moving objects on the screen. As long as it moved from point A to point B or the character shuffled their feet back and forward in some idea of a walk, uh, that was good enough. Often animation is an afterthought and only barely functional and, and, and done by the, the the single artist on the team or things like that. And that's, that's totally cool. Everybody's got um, limitations. Um, but I just want to do my part in making it one of the first things that's also talked about and making it also integral to the design. Um, so at the moment, I'm an animator, 3D artist and designer currently working with the Voxel Agents on The Gardens Between. Um, it's a project which I'm able to explore many of these concepts I'm talking about today. It's a surreal puzzle adventure game where instead of directly controlling the characters, you control time, the flow of time back and forwards. I was able to move uh, from solely an animation role to being integral to the design of the whole game by constantly stretching myself and striving to incorporate motion and these concepts into everything uh, within the game, not just the characters. This, uh, the project and team are amazing to work with. Um, I love these guys. 
Um, and, and another interesting challenge uh, when de uh, designing motion for the gardens between uh, is that I couldn't rely on any extreme frames of animation. Um, because the player could literally scrub forwards and backwards between any of my frames for the characters. Um, <laughs> they could even see between the frames that I just uh, had created. So I, I've, I've managed to sneak in a lot of exaggeration anyway in other events uh, within the game uh, and effects that aren't directly player controlled. <clears throat> All right, um, so let's get to more conceptual ideas now. Um, so there's two core ideas that I'm always focused on um, when designing motion. I often see these concepts not thought about enough for my liking, and I'd like to share my thoughts on them with you. Uh, but first, uh, there's this thing called the 12 Principles of Animation. Uh, it's this set of guidelines that is constantly used as a touchstone for animators. I'm just going to pop back up here. Hey. Um, <laughs> it's a set of guidelines that's constantly used as a touchstone for animators. They're great, but I'm not going to go uh, going to talk about them directly. Um, there's some overlap with what I'll be talking about, and please educate yourself about them if you haven't heard of the 12 principles before. Just Google it. Um, all right. Hold up. Let's go here. Hi. Uh, all right. So, there's two concepts, weight and perception. What do you want to talk about first? <laughs> All right. Uh, wait. All right. I don't know. That should have disappeared. Never mind. <laughs> All right. So wait. <laughs> When I talk about weight, it means talk, taking into account the physicality of the object, combined with the context or rules of the world or aesthetic treatment that it's presented in. Now, uh, everything in our physical world is constantly vibrating and changing. So, like, physics is all around us, right? <laughs> we live it. <laughs> so why is your button in your game a default UI and just sitting there at static? Um, make it pop in. Try and make it shake a little. How, how playful sh should it feel? Try to make your UI prompt feel like a, a little kid waiting for the toilet by hopping backwards and forwards, <laughs> left and right. Like, why not? Why not add that, add that mo moment in there to, to, to increase the experience? Oh, hold up. Let me just, um, what's happening there? Ah, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, should we talk about perception or are you ready to go on? Uh, oh my god, this is low. All right, uh, good, we did it. <laughs> All right, so perception. It's a really broad, deep, uh, nope, that's the wrong note. We have a screen uh, in front of us. It has a frame, uh, like 16 by 9, whatever. And regardless if your experience is the most dynamic 3D real-time stuff, it all gets flattened to 2D by the end of the day. I'll ignore VR for the moment. Um, understanding how people are viewing your moving visuals is so important. A camera movement is as valid and as powerful as moving a character at times. Uh, for example, I'm actually just moving the, car uh, the camera when I'm doing this. I don't know. It's not, it's not that great of an example, but you know. <laughs> Essentially, it's all just pixel, pixels in a square. Be aware of the composition of the space and where people are looking within that square. <clears throat> uh, yep, cool. Perception, more about perception. Uh, it's a really broad, deep topic, and I'm only going to be able to touch on it here. There's great psychology articles about it online. Again, just search for it um, uh, when you get home. In general, I feel what is often missing, missing in game development is deeper thought into what drives emotion and why we should or should not move a visual element on the screen. How do your animations fit into the experience you're creating and how does it fit into the overall composition of the screen? Um, if you weren't already, I hope you're now at least thinking about it. So understanding human perception and how people and their brains are processing, processing your visuals is really uh, important to me. The two most important things is uh, uh, to direct attention on a, sc on a screen uh, that the two most important aspects, I mean, it's pretty much what 
the entire screen is made out of, but it's motion and color. Changes in motion or changes in like mo mo moving a line that moves across the screen, that's motion, and then a, mo a, a line that changes from black to white, color. Um, those two things draw attention. Um, <clears throat> that's it. That's what it all boils down to. And what's important to note, however, is that our visual attention can usually be only in one place at any time. So having a flowing line of motion and color to direct the eyes towards objects and, and, and between them, like oh, my arms, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'll just get out of the way as well. Uh, ugh, lost my, okay, uh, between them is paramount. If the changes are too random, jerky, or s too much is happening, too many competing motion moments, or color changes on the screen are happening at, uh, happening at the same time, it can become overwhelming. Uh, jerkiness is good at, sometimes by snapping a, or directing attention to somewhere completely new on the screen from the previous thing that the viewer has been focused on. So say I had something uh, moving in the middle of the screen and then I'll just like jump me here. Hi. And then I'm back. I'll get out of here. Um, <clears throat> but like it needs to be a very obvious change to the current motion that the user, user has been viewing in order to be registered or perceived. Understanding physics and weight. Weight, gravity, acceleration. A essentially, understanding physics is key. Things don't jiggle in a void. They don't. <laughs> This is this is a fact, <laughs> and if they do, um, I'll, I, I hope they do actually. No, no, let's scratch that. People, <laughs> now people, uh, as I said before, um, people understand physics inherently. We live it every day. Pay attention to how quickly you can move your fingers from a fist to a wave. How they accelerate. How how they kind of fan out. Easing and curves between like like slow in slow out and like and bouncing as, as your hand changes is really important to make something feel like it has weight. Um, but what happens when an object hits a wall? It doesn't ease to a stop. It, suddenly, it stops suddenly because it, it's hit something that it cannot pass through. So that the easing, just like, you, you, you don't, I often see if, if, if you've got a falling ball and it's coming down to hit, hit the ground. And, uh, and then you key to, to say, oh, it hits the ground now. But you haven't paid, paid attention to the, um, the physicality of the ball. It's going to hit the ground. And if you, don't, um, if you don't make sure that the curves, uh, you, you don't control the curves directly uh, of, of, it, of it, its acceleration, it's going to hit the ground and, and slowly hit that point because, because you've keyed that. Uh, I don't know, there's, there's curves and then there's yeah, ease in, ease out. And um, just if something's, uh, some, things move in, in an arc, unless there's something in the way and then they stop and, and bounce. <laughs> um, and things also take time to accelerate with, with few exceptions. Um, physics and making sure your movements have some weight or presence to them is important, but that doesn't mean we're stuck to the physics of Earth. I think it's what's really important is to work out the rules of physics in your world or, or the aesthetic of physics in your world, your UI, your completely text-based games. What, what physics is affecting how you reveal each, each letter? Um, what is the weight be, be behind that? Uh, is, it, is it floaty? Is it underwater? Is it space? Is, uh, is, are things magical? Um, even when some, some, someone, a uh, character is jumping through midair, they're going to move in a different way as they're, as they're flying through the air than as when they were on the ground. They'll, they'll be a bit, bit slower, a bit more, um, a bit less grounded. Oh, because they're in the air. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, so how do those animations and, and or lack of animations, um, you probably see the one on the right here, um, there's a very graphical motion which is, has no easing or no physicality to it. And that's because it was designed as a very linear, uh, it's, it, the motion is designed to incorporate the linear aspect of the, the, the visuals. 
so that it's very like statically always moving in the, at the same rate. And that's really valid and really important as well. If, if you say my art style doesn't have weight to it, then at least you've thought about it and you've decided that there's no weight to it and you can go forward with that. But think about what, what type of weight. <laughs> Whoa, oh my God! <laughs> okay. Um. All right. Huh. I guess I made it jiggle. Let me just, um, let's, let's see if I can do this. This is, this is a, oh, shit. No. Um. All right, let's just restart. <laughs> Here we go. We did all these. Do you remember this? It was great. <laughs> yeah, physics. They're great. Very good. Understanding physics. All right. <clears throat> Next one. Um, so. Uh, all right. So physics is really hard and, and pretending uh, like making things move as if they have weight to them is, 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 is very inherently tricky. So there's a lot of tools that help and uh, a lot of the time you don't want to have to think really hard about physics and, and how things uh, move. Um, surely the computer can do it for you. Surely there's things to do it for you. Yes, there are things that can do it, but also no. <laughs> Motion capture and canned animations like the one there, um, available to small teams and uh, often general use and not designed for your intended purpose. And that's really important, intended purpose and how it fits into your experience. Um, uh, so, you can see Ooblets is, has got a bunch of dancers. Those are using the same system as the system that this weird voxel minotaur is using, as, uh, I think Mixamo, um, except that uh, what Glumberland have done is, de is decided that they, that they wanted to uh, take a shortcut and, and incorporate these canned animations from Mixamo into their game and allowed them to be dopey and fun and, 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 and and it fits within their world and their aesthetic treatment. Um, whereas this weird voxel guy is, is, has, has the weight of, of, a, of a realistic human who's like, uh, it's, it's pretty much it's like, it feels like someone's wearing an ill-fitting mascot suit and it just doesn't fit the, the badass attack that they really want it to happen. So, you know, just, just think about it. Um, so I don't know if you've guessed, but realism really isn't my jam. Um, <laughs> Mocap and can animation is a quick fix and often doesn't do anything much well, uh, particularly for real-time implementations and, um, and very focused design. If, if you want good communication, you're going to have to touch your motions and make sure that they are thought about. Um, you don't need to understand a lot of the ideas to start incorporating motion capture or a physics system. Um, uh, but when you do, you can pull off incredible stuff like um, raccoons by Punches Bears or anything that Punches Bears has done. He knows everything about uh, physics animation. It's incredible. Um, this is a broken GIF. This is, this is when he breaks it, but most of the time it looks really good. <laughs> um, uh, so if, uh, another thing is like, you know, if your character isn't full on human with proper proportions, those, uh, the movements that you get from um, these, these canned stuff is just not quite right. Um, Mocap and physics systems are not shortcuts, but if you're aware of how imperfect they are and that it's a stepping stone to great motion, you can really make it work in a non-realistic sense as well. Um, all right, code is amaz amazing, tools, is ama uh, tools are amazing, shaders are amazing, physics systems are so cool. <laughs> um, so this guy is um, is not keyed in uh, in any three D program. He's completely procedurally created. Hi, hello. Oh, it was it works worked really well in my bedroom. <laughs> um, so 
if in, if in doubt, you, you can skip key framing. You can skip literally defining all the keys you're going to be using. But as long as you know what, what procedural motion you're going to be using, um, like a, a, a cloth sim for the hair, a dynamic bounce um, to, to, uh, that, that uh, simulates physics um, to, to make things bouncy, um, you know, uh, stretch, uh, automated stretch where you only have to control one transform. So actually his, his arms here, I'm only controlling the hands. So if I go, ah, so it's just like, there's just a chain of wobbly things that follow the hands. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's really cool. Don't ignore it. Spend the time to learn how to do basic, uh, to get basic results with code and uh, visual based programming. It saves so much time. And, uh, and also you can get a lot of really cool things happening. Your programmers will love it and also hate your code. But <laughs> again, <laughs> tools are tools, and without understanding the core concepts and directing or purpose of the motion, the best code in the world won't help it be an effective tool for communication. Um, so yeah, understanding perception and physicality and, uh, is the biggest thing to me. Um, Often, if, if, if you don't take that into your account, your motions can tend to uh, feel floaty when they need to feel solid, jerky when they need to feel smooth. Um, when you've begun to truly think about these, these concepts and, uh, and how your object, character, text, camera reacts with the world and the screen, um, you can also break the rules um, to create truly engaging motions. Break physics to make something snap to provide a moment of impact, increasing how easy it is to understand perception. Or use how people perceive movement to overwhelm the eyes or hide details in your puzzle game by adding so much noise to the screen that it's impossible to work out. Um, make a secret flash. Make, it, make a secret object flash with a different color in the corner of uh, your eye, or a rock hiding in a secret ed entrance, shudder as you walk past, or stand up, kick you in the shins and run away. I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, last, last, uh, what have I done? <laughs> Was I in the way? Was that character in the way? I haven't been paying attention. Let's have a look. That's Aaron Halili. He's amazing. And David Levolansky. Is that in the way of any of that? No, nah, it's fine. Cool. Um, cool. S and definitely always try and simplify it. Try and work out the, the most s simple. Ha, huh, funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, way of, of, of getting to the end result. Um, so, simplifying how things move with a particular aesthetic treatment in mind is really effective. Um, for example, uh, I, I wanted to capture the sense of a puppet or a Muppet for my character on the screen. So I limited the motion to what a puppet, puppet is capable of and focused on just controlling the hands and the rotation of the, of the jaw with a, with a bit of like this motion, I don't know, just, just to make it feel a bit more alive. Um, <clears throat> but like, that's it. There's, there's, there's not, nothing too complex going on. I'm controlling hands and jaw. And, and that's enough to, to convey some kind of character, I hope. Hey. Nah. All right. <laughs> um, a lot can be said about the design of, of your art and, and how that also allows for different styles of motion and communication. That's another talk altogether. I'm so sure someone else has covered it. Maybe not already, but later today, who knows. Um, but yeah, that's kind of all I've got to say. Um, uh, I've got actually a few additional talking points or prompts. Uh, let me see if I press this button. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to have more slides that went along with these, but I just ran out of time. Um, so yeah, uh, this is, this is uh, actually, I'll just go to questions. Yeah, questions. Uh, so there's questions, or we can talk about any of these four things. I'll just open it up. That's it. That's it. That's my talk.
<laughs> oh. All right, so we're talking about thought then, I think. Uh, what? What? Okay, oh fuck, okay. So thought smears and, um, uh, what was the other one? Okay. <laughs> okay. Jeez. They're just re respawning. All right. <laughs> Not comedy. No one wants to talk about comedy. <laughs> Let's be 100% serious here. All right. <clears throat> um, all right, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just quickly go through. Uh, so smears and perceiving differences between frames. Smears are generally an aesthetic treatment that simulates how our brains piece together holes in our visual perception. Um, I don't, you've probably seen GIFs of like, uh, the best example of these are some Overwatch things where like, you know, McCree's like got his arm like bent all the way around covering the entire screen because it's really important that his gun is on the left hand side of the screen before it gets to the right, so it feels really snappy. Um, and, and things like that. Uh, smears are when you break the model um, <clears throat> to, to enhance or, or give our perception visual waypoints to, to focus on between frames. Um, so they, they're warped frames that accentuate the line of action between important compositions. The lower the frame rate, reg usually, the more important each frame becomes. Think of frames as visual anchors for our perception. The less there is, the more our brains fill in the gaps, which can be a really good thing. Brains love imagining things. <laughs> they do. Um, so like, oh my god, my notes died. So I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, keep going. So, like 60 frames per second um, is really great for realistic twitchy games that require the brain to not fill in many visual gaps. Like um, if you've got a really high high frame rate refreshing all the time, or your character animation is buttery smooth, and like and that that works really well for like a lot of high end AAA style motion where everything's mo capped, everything's like. I'm a guy, I'm walking around. Um, I don't know, like, like shooters and, 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 and action games and things like that. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but if you, if you go all the way down to 12 FPS, which is one of the lowest frames, frame rates you can get with, uh, with still maintaining a sense of smooth motion, um, it's great. Uh, it can be great fun because you can be more exaggerated with each uh, with each frame in order to uh, create interesting motions and 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 allow perception to, to fill in those gaps between each frame. Um, what's this one? Thought. All right. So allow time for thought. Um, so allow time for your own thought in, into into these motions, but also uh, allow time for um, the, the player's change of mind and, and, and change of focus. So if you see, uh, uh, hmm, I don't have a good example here. So, yeah, <laughs> my notes are really scattered. Characters um, on the screen uh, don't move smoothly often don't move smoothly from one thing that they're doing to the next without any pause or change of, in change of, uh, change of focus. So give time for your characters or your objects to think if they need to think. Um, give, uh, so like uh, one thing that I always think about is uh, that often you can lead, um, lead a head turn with eyes, so your eyes so the brain, you don't keyframe the brain, but if you <laughs> think about it, if you think about it, there's, 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 there's a moment before anything moves that the brain has decided that something's gonna move. And if you can think about that, then the eyes move and then the head moves and often there's a blink in between and like, there's like, you know, appreciate that you're trying to pretend that there's some sentience in, in that shell. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, one thing that we did in the gardens between was add a simple look at system on the head that helped helped blend the gap between walking and interacting with objects on the side of the path. Um, so as the characters move past, they just like turn their torso to look down, um, which was a, a kind of a bolt on uh, movement system to their regular walking. And that just really helped blend the gap between them literally jumping and doing stuff and on their regular, regular path. Um, uh, comedy, subverting expectations. <laughs> so um, how great was it when my, my hand just kept going up? <laughs> like everybody, everybody had a good time, um, <laughs> including me. I, I, I wasn't stressed at all. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Gen generally, comedy is, is is setting up what's normal or expected, and then subverting it, and and presenting with something new. Um, physics glitches are such a great example, and physics engines are using approximations of the rules within our own world, which is really helpful to get a baseline for subverting those expectations and making something really funny. Um, so when those things break, we love it because it's it it just it flips. Uh, what we expect on, on its head to, to create a, um, a really engaging motion that looks broken, but actually what the user's experiencing is um, something delightful. Um, again, context is key. If it's broken in a way that destroys your entire gameplay experience, don't do that. <laughs> but understand what your experience is and focus your motion and, and ways that you can subvert expectations to enhance that. Um, and then there's like effects and uh, reactive motion. So if, I, if I'm walking on the ground, I might get a puff of smoke, particles, all that stuff. It's amazing. I, I don't really want to talk much more about that, but it's really cool. Uh, make, that ha make that happen. Um, yeah, I'm going to kind of stop. What? There we go. Um, all right, that's it. Uh, I'm going to take questions. Yes? I have a bit of a beginner question because I come from 2D animation. Yeah. I wanted to play around with 3D, but like you mentioned, smears. Yeah. And how Overwatch has treated smears, and for example, the junk rat and yep. how he moves really fast and they've had to put in smears. Mm. Like technically? Like, yeah, a little bit technically. Yeah. How do you create a 3D smear when you have a model that you can't quite distort so much? Okay. Um, the trick is to make it be able to distort a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Overwatch was, uh, the, they've, they created their 3D characters and, and, and set up their system to allow for that type of motion because that was the goal. Um, they, they were inspired and, and decided that that was what they wanted. Um, wanted to that that was a, that was a technique that they wanted to use in their animations. So they they allowed um, they allowed time to to um, build build tools and 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 add add functionality into the into the character rigs that allowed for them to literally grab any uh, uh, like ring along the arm or anything and just stretch it. In in uh, and to camera or like uh, all that stuff. Um, that amount of work <laughs> is pretty unfeasible for small teams. Um, but you know, uh, this guy he's got like I don't know six bones in his arms and they're pretty wobbly. You could drag them around and and, and create a good uh, smear and like. Um, you know, scaling different different objects. Um, it's it's three D is quite technical to try and get a good uh, approximation of of two D where you can just draw the line of action and things like that. Um, but taking, I think, using two D concepts within three D is where I really love how things when when that happens. So yeah, I'm really focused on that. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Good. So I don't know if you caught uh, John Kane and Long Cole talk yesterday about Johnny Prince and the Internet. Uh, they did it, uh, a really great talk about how body types are represented. And I don't know if you've ever played Street Fighter 4. Uh, 
Oh, I know, I know, I know that it looks pretty cool. Yeah, the character in Brutus is a very fast character. The way he moves is kind of like the way he moves. It feels real bad. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, but it also kind of fits in a lot of ways, kind of the, it fits some of the tall girls of animation. Mm. So I, I really like when you had said you know, that you were inspired by kind of color and motion and adding music to things and, and really thinking about the way bodies, like, you know, have different kinds of movement and different kinds of motion. Yeah. And I really like that you brought that to the table and that you had a lot of Yeah. Yeah. Because that just feels bad. Right. It felt really bad. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's really a very specific thing to try and attempt. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> I guess, Jen, what I could have a go at, let's have a look here. If I go back to, um, I made a little round friend um, in. Here, so this guy. So he's he's not jiggly, but but he moves with a with a sense of of, of bounce and 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 changing form. Um, so you can and and then um, uh, I guess the jiggle physics is like uh, kind of similar to this guy's uh, bouncy hair. Um, uh, most of the time, it's it's really an, an aesthetic treatment as to how much things move. Um, once once you like, you could have made that guy um, quite floaty. Imagine he's full of air, you know, like like Boo from Dragon Ball Z or something like that. That would be really cool. Um, but yeah, I I don't I don't have a really good particular answer for that because I don't know his motions very well. Um, but I, I don't know. Does that Answer your question at all? I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, you were talking in terms of uh, using a broken rig or sort of exaggerated motion for comedy purposes, mm. like with your hands flipping away. Yep. Um, and there's games like Octodad that have used that as an entire aesthetic and mechanic. Exactly. Um, Horror. Um, oh my gosh. Um, okay, so uh, let me have a look here. So um, actually, Aaron Hilleli, if you have a look at his his work um, on his uh, Tumblr, he's created uh, a thing called um, the character uh, character synth, which is um, really really cool. Um, <clears throat> it's actually kind of similar to what this little guy's doing um, using the same type of Unity plugins. Um, but he's breaking every aspect of that, of that character based on, based on sound and like very like sharp, like kind of horror style like synths and stuff like that. And he, he'll break apart and like crazy lighting happens. But it's like it's in time to the music in particular, or, or, or the sounds, and so that's a very controlled destruction of a clean, of a clean shape. So um, I would say that um, the best way to do that for horror is to really tie it into to audio, and like when you have a broken feeling um, uh, motion that you that you think is feeling uh, terrifying, you can you can. Um, Kind of sync that to a to to what what it might sound like or, or, or how it might um, incorporate that, but you you will have to design how it breaks. You can't just let it break and then hope it fixes itself. You need to you need to understand uh, that you want it to break in a very particular way, and then go forward with that uh, in in mind as you create your experience. Yeah. Oh, five minutes. Cool. All right. Um. Yeah. Uh, 
that's that's kind of it. Oh, Rook. Hey, Rook. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> the Gardens Between has been a really tricky uh, project uh, to work on, particularly because the characters are both controlled by moving time forwards and backwards, but then they can jump out of time to interact with something and then go back to their timeline to, to, to walk forwards and back, uh, forwards. And they're kind of set on their path. So each level is almost like creating a a small animated uh, film, but we've had to rely on very uh, on um, a lot of modular things. I'm the only animator on the team, um, and so and everything's moving in that game. <laughs> I, I kind of pushed for maybe too much um, there, but <laughs> the um, the uh, trying to convey storytelling and sense of character um, with a with a kind of a, a limited budget is just. Um, uh, I've been generally a lot of observation um, and trying to understand how kids move. Kids move as if they don't know how to move. <laughs> Spoiler. Um, <laughs> um, and so like Arena, she's a very um, uh, brash, strong, uh, strong-willed little little kid and she'll, she'll be leading all the way. She's, she's always looking ahead so I make sure that um, she's looking at the path a certain amount of distance ahead of her at all times. Um, and then I give moments uh, for, for Frent, the, the boy, to, to stop and wait and, and stare at a tree or point at something as, as she turns around and, and like, freaking, you know, turns, what are you doing? You know, it's just uh, like, and I've had to um, make those motions quite modular for the, for the aspects of the game. Um, so we can kind of drag them along their timeline and, and, and be like, okay, friend stops here, he looks over there. Then after X amount of time, Arena turns around and kind of is like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, sorry. Um, she wouldn't say that. <laughs> um, it's, and, and yeah, <clears throat> it's a constant, it's, it's like, storytelling is, is, is it's tough. <laughs> um, and doing it with motion with no audio or, or text is, is, is also quite hard. Um, so you need to rely on your art, art style as well. Um, <clears throat> you can't always, <laughs> um, like, like they have to work together. It's the motion and the art style um, combined that, I mean, it's, it's pixels on a screen, they move. And you gotta make the colors and shapes make sense. That's, that's it. I'm so tired. <laughs> 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 Any more questions? No? Oh, yeah. Go. Um, so you just mentioned the bed, which you found quite hard to work with that and the sound for all of you. Yep. Um, ideally, how, why, how would you fix that? Like, Within the gardens? Or? Um, so actually, uh, one of the things I really like doing is having a having a sound to work from, um, or even just an idea of a sound to work from. You can get a good sense. Of, I mean, animation is better if you have reference in any way. Um, so if you know what the what sound it's going to make, um, you can you can animate to that sound. Um, but also, if you if you've got got YouTube uh, reference of someone falling down and you think that's great, you can use that as well um, to, to uh, help drive that, that motion. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, but like, you know, like if I had a sound for, for, for a UI prompt, that will, that will like that, that'll make me think of something that, that, that pulses in a, in a rather um, soft way, but, but probably with some light or something like that. But if it's like, you know, that's very like, you know, it's going to feel way more mechanical and snappy and, and um, you know, 
it, it goes both ways. You can you can animate and then and then get it to the audio person, and if if they're if they're on the ball, they'll they'll give you that sound that makes sense. But you can go the other way and 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 animate two sounds, and I really like doing it that way. But um, it's not always how it goes. Does this, is, is this really just broken now? Hello? Uh, yeah, I really wanted to make like a full game that you would all play, um, but it just didn't. I just, I had to do slides and I had to talk. So this is what you get. Um, maybe, maybe another time. Um, oh, yes. Favorite thing? That's my mum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite thing is when um, when you see it moving for the first time, um, and uh, moving. <sighs> One of my favorite things is setting it up. With, with a goal in mind for that motion, and then seeing the, the, the potential of that result. So if I'm building something in, um, in a 3D program, and I'm like, oh, I want it to be really stretchy and weird. Um, so I made, made a bunch of different uh, articulation points in it, and, and it can stretch and scale and do really strange motions. Then I'll often uh, test it out to its extremes, and that's where it's really fun, even though it's not exactly um, going to be the end product. I really like breaking things um, <clears throat> in, in, uh, in 3D and, and animation in general. I like making really silly stuff. Um, but, then, but then trying to incorporate that and, and rein it in to a uh, directed design. Um, yeah, seeing the end result is freaking amazing. Um, yeah, we'll just end it there. Thank you. <laughs>